Welcome back. It's been a year full of initial public offerings and I'm going to do my final IPO valuation for this year. It's a company very different than the IPOs I've been valuing all year. If you think about the IPOs, IPOs are valued from Uber to Lyft to WeWork. These were young companies early in the life cycle with small revenues, big operating losses. But the company I'm going to value today fits none of those characteristics. It's Aramco. Aramco, as many of you probably already know, traces history back to the history of oil in the Middle East. It was created by Texco Chevron, or their predecessor oil companies, as the Arabian American Oil Company. And over time, as oil has grown in the Middle East, Aramco has grown with it. Of course, the turning point for Aramco came about in 1960 when the oil producing countries created OPEC. And again in the 1970s when OPEC raised oil prices. Finally, the Saudi government nationalized the oil, uh, the, the company and the oil fields, essentially giving it control of all of Saudi Arabia's oil reserves. The company was renamed Saudi Aramco in 1988. Now with that short history lesson, let's talk about what it is that makes Aramco so special. The most interesting and most, uh, most value attracting feature of Aramco is the reserves it sits on. It sits on 330 billion barrels of oil and gas in reserves. <clears throat> Those are Saudi Arabian reserves, a quarter of all of the world's reserves and almost 10 times larger than the reserves for the next largest oil company, which would be ExxonMobil. In addition to having lots of reserves, what gives Aramco an advantage is these reserves are in a part of the world where getting the oil out is really easy to do. I mean, oil is close to the surface in Saudi Arabia, and the cost of extracting oil is so low for Aramco that it could break even at prices as low as $20 a barrel, whereas most other oil companies would need $40, $45, or $50 a barrel. In fact, if you bring in the newer ways of getting oil out, from shale oil to whatever else has come up technologically, you're looking at even higher break-even prices. So lots of oil, easy to extract, and it shows up in the numbers. In 2018, Aramco produced almost 13.6 million barrels of oil per day, and it generated revenues of about 355 billion. What's more impressive though than the revenue number, which is already a pretty impressive number, is it generated operating income of $212 billion on those revenues and net income of $111 billion, indicating how little it faced its costs in getting the oil out of the ground. Now, when you invest in Aramco, we need to step back and think about what you're investing in. In a sense, you're not investing in a company, you're investing in a country. And here's why. Saudi Arabia is one of the 20 wealthiest countries in the world, but it derives almost all of its wealth from oil. In fact, 80% of its GDP comes from oil, and Aramco controls it all. So in a sense, Aramco is Saudi Arabia Inc. You're investing in a country not a company. And it gets even dicier when you think about how Saudi Arabia is structured. Saudi Arabia is run by the House of Saud. It's run by the Saudi royalty. In fact, it's a monarchy. And to that extent, investing in Aramco is an investment in the House of Saud. To the extent that the House of Saud remains intact and prosperous, you're going to share in that prosperity. But any troubles that come to it will be troubles to you as an investor. Keep that in the background as we think about the pricing and the valuation of Aramco. Now, when you think about the consequences of a company that's a country and perhaps an extension of a royal family, it shows up in a few places. The first is in corporate governance. When you normally buy shares in a publicly traded company, you think like a shareholder that you have some say in how the company is run. Dispense with that delusion of the Aramco. You will have no control over this company now or in the future. The Saudi government is in fact pretty open about this in its prospectus in telling you that it controls the company and will preserve veto power over big decisions. So you're not really a shareholder in Aramco, you're a capital provider. There is in fact the reality that since Aramco is almost entirely Saudi Arabia based, and it is a reflection of Saudi Arabia, that investing in Aramco, you're going to be exposed to country risk in Saudi Arabia. And that country risk takes the form of both traditional default risk and whatever economic risk you face in a country, as well as political risk. And in fact, you could argue that with Aramco, the bigger risk you worry about is political risk. Now, Saudi Arabia might have one of the more stable governments in the Middle East, and that's not saying much. But the reality is the last decade has brought us surprise after surprise in the Middle East. From Egypt 
to Libya to perhaps Lebanon, we've seen how quickly governments can change, how, how quickly the rules on the ground can change. And to the degree that you worry about in Saudi Arabia, it is going to affect how much you think Aramco is worth or how you should price the company. So let's talk about a few twists in pricing and valuing the company by looking at the prospectus and seeing what the company tells you about itself. First, let's start with dividends. The company in the prospectus, in fact, com commits to paying at least $75 billion in dividends collectively to equity investors starting in 2020, going through 2024. So for the next five years, you're going to receive at least $75 billion in dividends and perhaps more. Beyond 2024, dividends will revert back to the normal status, which is their discretionary. But the reality is, given how much this company generates in income and cash flows, it'll have no trouble, at least as long as the ground rules don't change in continuing to pay these dividends. The company is also very clear that this public, the, the, the going public of Aramco is not to raise capital for the company. The company doesn't need it, but to diversify the Saudi economy. So the proceeds from the IPO are not going to go back into the company. They're going to lead the company to and go to the Saudi government, which presumably is going to invest them in other businesses to diversify the economy. Third, once this listing is complete, Aramco will trade on the Saudi stock exchange, not on the London stock exchange, not on the New York stock exchange. And two things follow. The first is almost instantaneously, this company will dominate the Saudi index. It will be by far the largest listing. It will account for the bulk of the index. The second is the Saudi index is not known for its liquidity. So you're going to have liquidity constraints added by the fact that the Saudi exchange also puts limits on how much stock prices can move in a day. They can't move more than 10%. Again, file those away. Here's the second part of twists that come with this IPO. As part of inducements because the Saudi government wants to get domestic investors investing in the company, it's going to give one bonus share for every 10 shares bought by a Saudi national if that investor holds the shares for six months. However, this is restricted only to small investors because the cap runs out at 1,000 shares. The most you can get then is 100 bonus shares. So beyond that, you're going to be like any other stock order. So the effects of these bonus shares on the rest of the shareholders is going to be pretty small, almost negligible, because it's restricted to small domestic investors. The corporate tax rate is one of those things that was fuzzy. Here and here's why. Prior to this public listing, Aramco was owned by the Saudi government. It was, in fact, what allowed the Saudi budget to be, to be balanced. The cash flows from Aramco were what allowed the budget. Now, whether those cash flows were collected in taxes or royalties or dividends really didn't matter because the Saudi government got all three. So leading up to this listing, one of the things that needed to be clarified, and this is why the, the IPO took so long to come to fruition, was specifying those numbers. And for the first time in the prospect, as you see some clarity on these numbers, the Saudi government specifies that the tax rate on downstream income, not the upstream income, which is the bulk of their income, will be 20%. This also is a cut, which is a, which is a kind of a tax on, 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 in, on revenues. But in some, these changes were already in effect in 2018. So rather than get confused by the layers of tax rates and, and what was added on it, the effective tax rate that this company paid last year, which is about 48% of its taxable income, is likely to remain pretty much unchanged in the future. Why? Because the Saudi government needs that, those tax revenues to balance the budget. Finally, in royalties, there's some rejiggering of the royalty rates lowering the royalty rate at existing oil prices it goes down to 40% from I think 45%. But in return, the Saudi government has created a tiered royalty system. Rising to 45%, the oil price goes between 70 and 100 and 80% if the oil price goes above 100. File that away because that's going to again affect how you think about Aramco as an investment. So let's talk a little bit about the numbers you've been seeing for Aramco. Early when the Saudi government talked about taking Aramco public, the number that the Saudi government put out was it expected the company to be priced at about $2 trillion or more. Now, the numbers that have been floating around in the last few weeks since the IPO was announced have been ranging from $1.2 trillion to $2.3 Basically, these are numbers that are very wide. 
But still, the, 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 the Crown Prince and the Saudi royalty are, pu are still pushing for a $2 trillion pricing. Now, as we try to make sense of these different numbers, it should be worth noting that these don't come from valuations of Aramco, they come from pricing Aramco relative to other oil companies. Again, that's not uncommon in IPOs. It's what you usually see. So let's do a little pricing of Aramco. To price Aramco, here's what I did. I looked at other publicly traded oil companies. Of course, none of these oil companies is quite like Aramco, but we've got to take what we can get. So these are integrated oil companies around the world. I've, I've kept my sample to oil companies with market caps above 10 billion, integrated oil companies with a market cap above, above 10 billion. I have 27 companies and I've computed typical statistics, the average, the median, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile of a bunch of ratios. These are pricing ratios to our equity multiples, price earnings and price to book. The, the rest are enterprise value multiples, enterprise value to revenues, enterprise value to EBITDA, enterprise value to invested capital. In addition, I've created two multiples that are specific to oil companies. One looks at the enterprise value as a function of the reserves that the oil company has in millions of barrels. And the second is the enterprise value to the production of oil that that company had again in millions of barrels. So I've got the pricing that exists in the sector now. Here's my first try at pricing Aramco. I took the VAR, the seven different multiples that I had, and I priced Aramco using all seven, at the me using the median value, the first and the third quartile. And you can already see the range of pricing that I get for Aramco is huge. If I price Aramco based on book value or sets, price to book ratios or, or um, enterprise value to sales, I get pretty low value, uh, pricings for Aramco. I mean, at least relative to the numbers you saw before. I get pricings of 270, 300, 350 trillion, uh, 350 billion dollars. And its value looks very much like the value of very large oil companies. So looked at, looking at Aramco through the lens of book value and sales, it doesn't look that special. But if you look at it through the perspective of, a, of income, which is where you're going to see the prime advantage of Aramco come out. Remember, there's the lowest cost oil in the world. You see a huge EBITDA and huge net income. And if I use the EBITDA number and come up with an estimated value, my value rises above a trillion. If I use the net income of 111 billion and I use the median or the 75th percentile, I end up with pricing approaching 1.5 trillion. You can already see why investment bank pricing can be all over the place. Of course, my highest pricing comes when I focus on Aramco's most impressive asset, its control of the Saudi oil reserves. In fact, price based on its reserves, the pricing for Aramco could be through the roof, four trillion, five trillion, six trillion, because it has so much in reserves. But the problem with pricing on reserves is you can't extract all of those reserves. Aramco is actually constrained in how much oil it can take out of the ground. The Saudi government restricts it to producing 12 billion barrels. A lot of barrels of oil, but 12 billion. And if you price it based on its production, the pricing you get for the company starts to rise towards 2 trillion or a little above. So if you price it based on book value sales, it looks not that impressive for 300, 350, 400 billion. If you price it based on income, you get a tr trillion to trillion and a half. If you price it based on reserves or in production, you get two trillion or higher. Now, a couple of caveats. One is, uh, as I talked about the production limits, Aramco also has the rights to these reserves given to it for the next 40 years with the possibility of a 20 year extension but um, it's not in perpetuity. And if it keeps producing 12 million barrels of oil, which is its restriction, it's going to use those reserves up pretty much over 40 or 50 years. Second, in terms of governance and risk, the two things you worry about Aramco that you might not worry about with an Exxon Mobil is the first is the, the Saudi government's absolute control of the company. We talked about the whys and the what's of it. And the second is the political risk that comes with that, with, with so much dependence on one country and the government behind it. Now you're saying, so what? Well, let's take an extreme example. For the last few years, Russian oil companies have, to, have, the, have had the Aramco promised space. Not only are they dependent on a riskier country, in this case Russia, but an even more unpredictable corporate governance model in the Russian model. 
you see how markets have treated Russian companies and I've taken five different multiples here, price earnings, price to book and computed what the multiple looks like for Russian integrated oil companies versus all oil companies. You can see the discount that the market attaches can range from 40 to 60 percent depending on the multiple you're looking at. I'm not saying Saudi Arabia is as risky as Russia, but I'm saying that when you price the Saudi uh, Aramco, one of the factors you've got to bring in is this country risk and the corporate governance risk. And that risk right now will cause a discount, not as high as the Russian companies, but who knows? Five years from now, the risk in Saudi Arabia rises, you're going to see the discount get larger. So that's pricing Aramco, and you can see the range you get is huge depending on what metric you use and how you adjust for the country risk. Let's talk about value Aramco. Before I, I, I'll use three different approaches to valuing Aramco and I'll talk about why. But these are some general assumptions I'm going to make in all of my valuations. The first is I'm going to value Aramco in US dollars. Why? It's easier to do. Every commodity company around the world has, you know, sells its commodities into a global market that's dollar denominated. In fact, you could argue that a dollar denominated valuation is easier in a commodity company no matter where it's, set, it's situated. I'm not suggesting that there's no Saudi real risk because the costs are all in Saudi real. But for the moment, at least, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep the peg going right now. There's a pegged exchange rate for the Saudi real, and, I'm, uh, and by doing my valuation in US dollars, I'm evading the issues that will come about if that peg unpegs, but I'm going to do my valuation in US dollars. Because I'm doing my valuation in US dollars, my inflation rate has to be US dollar inflation rate, and I'm going to assume it's about 1%. I get that by looking at the difference between the US T-bond rate and the TIPS rate. It's a very rough proxy for expected future inflation in dollars. For equity risk, I'm going to use an approach I've used before for country risk. And if you're interested, you can look at my country risk post where I start with the default spread for the country, which for Saudi Arabia is a small number. It's a highly rated country. I come up with a risk premium of about 0.79% for Saudi Arabia, which added to my mature market equity risk premium, which I compute for the S&P 500 at the start of every month, which is 5.44% at the start of November gives me a total equity risk premium of 6.23%. For the life of the company, rather than using the growing perpetuity, which we tend to use for most companies, I'm going to use a 50 year life. Aramco in a sense is not a going concern that's going to last forever because your, your asset, your central asset are oil reserves and oil reserves are finite. And in this case, if you take the production, which is driving your revenues and cash flows each year, you know, about 50 years, even if you find more oil in Saudi Arabia of oil under the ground, and I'm going to use a 50 year life. Incidentally, I have to tell you that that assumption doesn't make much of a difference because if I used to perpetuity, my value is within 5% or whatever you're going to say. So don't make this your central point of disagreement because you can use a perpetuity and you're going to get pretty close to the same value you got with 50 years. I'm going to value Aramco using three different approaches. In the first approach, I'm going to just focus on promised dividends and accept the dividends. This is almost a karmic approach where you say, look, I have no control over the company. The company has very little control over itself. It's a dividend machine. I'm going to just take the present value promised dividends and value the company. Think of this as a, as, a, as a constrained valuation where the company is constrained on everything, it's constrained on what it can pay out, and you take what you can get, which is promised dividends. In the second approach, I'm going to relax the assumptions and give the company some freedom in how much it invests, which drives its growth rate, and, and how much it pays out in dividends. I'm going to, just, in a sense, value Aramco using potential dividends. Sounds mysterious, but you're going to see the, the, the change when I do my valuation in a minute. And finally, I'm going to value Aramco as a company. Now, normally when you value a company, as a company, you're giving it flexibility to change its financing policy. Again, with Aramco, there's not that much room for it to change. So given the limited room, I'm going to value Aramco. So value Aramco based on promised dividends, potential dividends as a company. Let's start with promised dividends. Now, if you look at the prospectus, the dividend that is promised as a base dividend, 75, million, let's, uh, 75 billion, let's assume that those dividends, and remember the, comp, the, the Saudi Arabia reserves the right to increase those dividends. Let's assume that you buy Aramco for its promised dividend, 75 billion, you put in an inflation rate on the dividends, 1% a year, 
you're essentially buying Aramco as if it were a glorified bond. You're buying it just for the dividends. So the downside is you're now stuck with just the dividends. You're not laying claim on any of the other cash flows. The upside is because these promised dividends should be pretty, you know, pretty easy to predict. They're more certain than traditional cash flows. I'm going to give these cash flows a much lower discount rate. To get the discount rate here, here's what I did. Because I'm doing my valuation in US dollars, I started with the UST bond rate, 1.8%. And I use the beta for royalty trusts and real estate investment trusts. These are investments in the US that tend to be primarily for the dividends. They're finite life investments. So the risk of those investments tend to be low, and you see that reflected in a beta of 0.5. What does that mean? Aramco is half as risky as a typical company because you're focusing just on the dividends. For the equity risk premium, as I said earlier, I'm going to use 6.23%. You bring those numbers together, you get an incredibly low cost of equity in dollar terms. Before you get too excited, Remember that this is more bond than stock. So compare it to a cost of borrowing and you're going to see very quickly that it's not that unreasonable. You discount just promised dividends at that low cost of equity. What you get as a present value is about $1.63 trillion. So now that we have a promised dividend value of equity for a round of $1.63 trillion, let's talk about potential dividends. You're saying, what are potential dividends? Companies don't always pay out what they can afford during dividends. Some pay more some pay less. In the case of Aramco, I think 75 billion is too low a number because they can afford to pay out more. And here's my basis. Aramco, even if you give them a growth rate, is not a high growth company. It cannot be. And in this case, I've given it a 1.8% growth rate. That's roughly a nominal GDP growth on a very conservative basis for global growth. To grow at 1.8% a year, Aramco doesn't have to reinvest very much. And here's why. Its return on equity last year was about 41%. One very rough measure of how much you have to reinvest is you divide the expected, in this case, the expected growth rate of 1.8% by that return equity. You get a reinvestment rate of about 4.39%. In other words, you deliver a 1.8% growth rate, Aramco has to invest only 4.39% of its net income. And if you think about its net income being 111 billion, that gives them a free cash flow equity or a potential dividend of about 108 billion. Now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna replace the $75 billion in potential dividends with my promised dividends, a much higher number. I'm gonna let that number grow at 1.8% a year for 50 years. To discount those, div those potential dividends back, I'm going to use a cost of equity that's more reflective of the risk of an integrated oil company. This is no longer just a plain promised dividend where I can get away using a REIT or a royalty cost of equity. And with that much higher cost of equity of 8.15%, I, I get a present value of those potential dividends of $1.59 trillion. Now, I've, I haven't quite added cash and cross holdings here. The net income is a little based primarily on their existing operating assets. So I add cash and cross holdings, and I get a value for the equity of 1.65 trillion. That's surprisingly close to 1.63 trillion. Remember, I, the cash flows are higher, but the risk in these potential dividends is also higher. Finally, I valued Aramco as a business. Now, normally when you value a company as a business, you give it a chance to change its mix of debt and equity. The case of Aramco, I don't think it's going to use that advantage that much because it's going to stay predominantly equity funded. Now, and if you bring in that low debt ratio and, and, and the cost of debt that it has, and the cost of debt I estimated by looking at its rating, its, its company rating, Moody's recently rated it A1, that gives it a default spread of about 90 basis points above the risk free rate, 2.7% in dollar terms, pre-tax pre cost of debt, I get a cost of capital of about 8.08%. Now the cash flows I'll be discounting will be cash flows of the firm, pre-debt cash flows. That's not going to be that different for Aramco because it has so little debt. And you see that in the numbers. It doesn't have to reinvest very much, again for the same reasons. Growth rate is only 1.8%, its return on capital is through the roof, almost 45% and based on its uh, after-tax operating income last year, and I'm assuming that the effective tax rate it pa passed last year, which already reflects the tax changes the Saudi government is planning for the company, I'm going to end up with a cash flow of about $108 billion, expected free cash flow, after the reinvestment. I let those cash flows grow, 
I discount them at the cost of capital. The value that I get for the operating assets is about $1.64 billion. I add cash and cross holdings, just like I did with the potential dividend approach, but now I subtract our debt and minority interest. I end up with the value for the equity of almost $1.67 billion, but very close again to the $1.63 and the $1.65 billion. Now, actually, I was actually surprised at how close the range was between $1.63 and $1.67 trillion. But here are a couple of afterthoughts that you should take into account before you put a final number on, this on the equity of the company. The first is, I don't think I fully captured political risk in these valuations because I included the conventional measure of country risk based on default risk. The big fear you should have as an Aramco investor is the fear of what I'd call regime change risk. You're saying that's low, you're right. It's a low, there's a low risk of it happening, but it's definitely not zero. The second thing to factor in is the nature of the royalty setup. The uh, Aramco, Saudi Arabia is set up with Aramco with the tiered royalties, climbing to 80% above a $100 oil price, means your upside is more limited because of the new royalty structure. And because you invest in equity for the upside, that's going to crimp your value. So. The political risk of regime change and upside limits, I think, reduce the value. There's one offsetting, a mild, mild offsetting factor, which is normally oil companies are all, have to take the oil price as a given. They don't have much influence over the oil price. Aramco is different. Because Saudi Arabia is such a big part of overall oil production, it has historically had had an outsized role in what the oil price is. It's not like the 1970s where it could control the oil price, but it does influence the oil price. That could effectively put a limit on downside risk because Saudi Arabia is not going to get the, let the oil price drop to 10 or 12 or $8 per barrel, which could be devastating for Aramco. The overall value effect, I think, if you bring in the political risk, the upside limits, and the fact that it's a price set is more negative than positive. So if I would attach a value, I would start with the 1.65 trillion that I got from a pure valuation model. Adjusting for regime change and the upside limits, I end up with a value closer to 1.5 trillion. And that's because I'm assessing a fairly low risk to political discontinuous political risk regime change. If your assessment is there's much more risk, the value attached to Aramco will be significantly lower. Now, over the weekend, this last weekend, we got some more clarity on the Aramco IPO. We now have a sense that it's going to be about 1.5% of the share. So it's going to be a tiny slice of the equity. And the rumored pricing is about a $1.7 trillion pricing, a little towards the upper end of the spectrum because, you know, based on pure pricing and valuation, the values I got were closer to $1.5 trillion, especially with the adjustment. But it's still within shouting distance of the value. And my guess is that at this pricing, they'll have no trouble filling the subscription. My guess also is that at this pricing, the company is going to be more attractive to domestic investors than international investors, especially Saudi Arabian investors. And those investors are getting a solid investment. I mean, I think if you, as long as they walk in with open eyes, in what sense? Well, when you invest in Aramco, the bulk of your returns are going to come in the form of dividends and price appreciation is going to be an afterthought. I'm not saying there will be no price appreciation, but this will remain a stock where the bulk of the returns will be dividends. If they, um, they will have no say in how the companies run, so no illusions there. If they're worried about risk, it should be more regime change and oil price risk. That's, that's really what I'd worry about. And if you're a Saudi investor, the one thing that I would be cautious about is if you are a Saudi investor who lives in Saudi Arabia, you probably either work for Aramco or the Saudi Arabian government or for a company very dependent on what oil prices are. And to the extent that you are human capital is therefore very much driven by what oil prices do. I'd be cautious about taking your pension fund money and your savings and putting in Aramco. And essentially you're doubling down. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. So as a Saudi investor, you might be attracted to Aramco by the name and the reputation. But it's not a great idea if you think about spreading your risk. Now, you might not care what I think about Aramco, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And so whether you care or not, Aramco is not the stock for me for two reasons. One is I'm lucky enough not to need any cash flows from my investments for liquidity. I have enough income to cover that. And from, from that perspective, for me to invest in a high dividend paying stock, a stock like Aramco, just creates tax 
taxes due because I'll have to pay the taxes and the dividends. So cash flows are not that attractive to me today. So basically, I'm not a high dividend stock investor just for the sake of collecting dividends. Second, if I am investing in oil company, often I'm investing in it because I have an oil price view that I think oil price will go up. And in the case of Aramco, the Saudi government has taken away some of the upside with the royalty, the tiered royalty setup. The, the, this company, though, I think will be the ultimate politically incorrect investment because it is an investment in oil, not even in oil prices, on the future of oil. And in a world where people are dependent on fossil fuels for their everyday living, but they seem to look down on those people who create those fossil fuels. I mean, you, you see it already around the country in terms of investors putting pressure on funds to get rid of their fossil fuel investments. So this is an investment that's going to be politically incorrect, both because it's a bet on oil and it's an indirect bet on the House of Saud. Neither is particularly popular now in most circles, and you've got to be willing to take the heat. I don't think too many college endowment funds are going to be investing in Aramco, and many portfolio managers might be turned off by the potential backlash as well. Now, I don't much care for political correctness, and I've never cared for investors who seem to think of investing primarily as a, as a vehicle for um, virtue signaling. I think that it's great that you're a virtuous person, but if you're investing primarily to show me how virtuous you are, that doesn't seem to be a great way to invest. I'm, I'm actually tempted to buy a Ramco just to watch the heads of those people explode. But I, I know that's petty and that's uh, small-minded and it's self-defeating. So I'm going to, for the moment, stay an observer in Aramco rather than an investor. Because this is going to be an interesting stock slash bond to watch over time. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed this talk.